From this point, there was no way of getting Roberts to school. His old desire to benefit a guilty world gained continually in strength during these weeks, and it conquered every other desire in his soul. To all who knew him, there was something strange in his manner now, and he caused them great anxiety that his mind was becoming impaired. A Dr. Hughes from the United States, who happened to be in the area, spent some time with him and feared for his mental stability. Tutors and friends didn't know what to do for the best. The month of October was to be a month of intense prayer for God's guidance as to the next step. Exactly a week after his experiences at Blaenanerch, Evan took part in a revival service in Tour Gwyn, some five miles from Newcastle Emlyn. It was led by Joseph Jenkins, the minister at Newquay. These early experiences were to give Evan Roberts the blueprint that he was to follow in his own meetings. The minister opened the meeting for anyone to speak, and Evan Roberts took the opportunity of encouraging the congregation to win souls for Christ. The service commenced at 6.15 and closed at 10.15. Four hours meeting and no one but young people taking part. A great number of those young people were girls from Newquay, teenagers and women in their early 20s already on fire since the spring of the year. This was most unusual during the early 1900s, where pulpit oration and public speaking was almost totally dominated by men. It was on a long five-mile walk from this meeting that Evan Roberts, turning to his best friend and companion, Sidney Evans, asked, Do you think that it is too much to ask God to save 100,000 in Wales? Speaking some months later to a Gorsainan minister, he explained, After receiving the Spirit, some of us agreed to ask the Lord for 100,000 souls in Wales for Christ. And I saw Jesus Christ presenting a sort of cheque to his father, and on it written, 100,000. And it's all right. Within two years, the cheque was to be cashed. Another revival meeting attended by Evan Roberts was at Capel Drindnod on the 28th of October. Anne, Evan Phillips' daughter, was an eyewitness to the event. The Reverend Joseph Jenkins and the girls from New Quay were there, holding a revival meeting. Roberts went up early in the afternoon to prepare himself for the six o'clock service. He was in the wood praying. After entering, he had his eyes closed and was under some wonderful influences. The meeting went on excellently in singing and prayer, but before long it began to cool, because speaking took the place of the prayer and praise. The meeting's going down, said Roberts, and I cannot bear this. At once he was on his feet and saying fervently that Jesus was not glorified as he should be because people wanted to show themselves. With these words he fell in the pew and prayed in such a manner that no one in the congregation had ever heard such a prayer. He asked me to sing. I refused about five times, but at last I did and he accompanied me full of fervour. Thanks for the meeting, asked Kapel Drindod. It will be with me eternally. Evan didn't sleep all night. The divine outpouring was so heavy that I had to shout out and ask God to withhold his hand. Anne's sister, Rachel, had not experienced the same influence as the others. Evan asked her if she had refused to obey the Holy Spirit in any way. No, I don't think so. But I have felt many times on Sundays that I would like to repeat some hymn, were it not that I fear what people would think and that I want to show myself. Oh yes, he remarked, that is it. Refusing to do a small thing like that is sufficient for him. Obedience must be given in the smallest thing. It looks small to us, but when obeying, the blessing comes. Pui a 
Sunday, 30th of October, 1904. Evan Roberts, the revivalist, is ready. Envisioned by the spirituality and the boldness of the new key girls, he desires to go back to Lacha to reach his own youth with this message. This he explains to W.T. Stead. One Sunday as I sat in the chapel, I could not fix my mind upon the service, for always before my eyes I saw as in a vision the schoolroom in my own village, and there sitting in rows before me, my old companions and all the young people, and I saw myself addressing them. I shook my head impatiently and strove to drive away the vision, but it always came back. And I heard a voice in my inward ears, as plain as anything, saying, Go and speak to these people. For a long time, I would not, but the pressure became greater and greater, and I could hear nothing of the sermon. Then at last, I could resist no longer, and I said, Well, Lord, if it is thy will, I will go. Then instantly, the vision vanished. The whole chapel became filled with light so dazzling that I could faintly see the minister in the pulpit, and between him and me the glory as the light of the sun in heaven. And then you went home? 
No, I went to my tutor and told him all things and asked him if he believed that if it was God or the devil. And he said, the devil does not put good thoughts into the mind. I must go and obey the heavenly vision. So I went back to my own village. On Monday, October the 31st, Evan Roberts left Newcastle Emlyn for Lacher, intending to be away for a week. He would not return for five months. Writing to Florrie Evans that morning, he asked to be remembered in prayer. Writing to another of the girls whilst on the train, he explains his motives. The reason for this is the command of the Holy Spirit. He gave the command last night at the meeting, and my thoughts were wandering, and my mind riveted on our young flock at Mariah. There seemed a voice, as if it said, you must go, you must go. Please excuse the pencil and the writing. This has been written while the train was in motion from Newcastle Emlyn to Pencader. Evan Roberts' arrival at Lacher was unexpected. At first, his mother thought he was ill. He explained that he was going to work amongst the youth of the area and planned to travel throughout Wales, offering Christ to sinners. Mrs. Roberts sought to bring him back down to earth by reminding him of school and finance. Evan replied that, God would provide, as God hath plenty. The rest of the family noted the difference in him. His speech was changed. This wasn't the Evan who went to college six weeks previously. Hearing that his brother Dan was off work due to a weakness in his eyes, Evan declared that his eyes would recover immediately. And they did. Dan was to become another of the key players in the spread of revival over the next few months. Evan Roberts' prophetic words to his brother were on the verge of fulfillment. Dan, you shall see there will be a great change at Lacher in less than a fortnight. We are going to have the greatest revival Wales has ever seen. Monday evening, the 31st of October, 1904. Evan Roberts, now back at Lacher, goes to the prayer meeting held every Monday here at Maria Lacher. At the end of the meeting, he asks people to stay behind. 16 people stay behind, plus one little girl. It's the beginning of the Evan Roberts revival meetings here in this church at Mariah. In two weeks' time, the excitement will have gone throughout the hall of Wales. For the next week, it's going to be here in this room, in Pisgah, just a few miles down the road, and in some other local chapels. Evan Roberts is excited. Things are going to happen. Things are actually happening. On the Saturday, at the end of that first week, he writes to Elsie Phillips, a friend, describing what he is going through. We hold a prayer meeting every night at eight o'clock. These meetings have been a success. The young people say they could sit all night. Monday night, I explained to them the object of the mission. Then I told them of the Spirit's work in New Quay and Newcastle Emlyn, and urged them to prepare for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now this was the plan I have taken under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There are four things to be right. You can go to heaven without being filled with the Holy Ghost, but without being filled, you will lose much on the way. Number one, you must obtain full and complete pardon for the sins of the past. If the past is not all right, it must be made so. Every sin you know of, confess it honestly before God. Number two, is there anything doubtful in your life? If so, it must be removed and done away with. Is there a habit of doubtful character in your life? Away with it. If there is, there cannot be any joy in your heart until you remove the questionable habits and pleasures. Self-denial is one of the very first essentials of the religion of Christ. Number three, 
complete and immediate obedience to the Holy Spirit. Say, not something prompts me to pray. It is not something, it is the Holy Ghost. Whatsoever he says to you, do it. The world may laugh. He did not, you will not be here long. Bow to him now. Do not say hush when one breaks into prayer. Resist not the Spirit. 4. A public and personal confession of Christ. How long will it take you to make a confession of Christ? Stand up now. Do not look at one another. Out with a confession. These are the four things leading to the grand blessing. This is our success this week in public confession. Monday night, 16. Tuesday, 6. Wednesday, 4. Thursday, 20. Friday, 19. Total, 65. I was once far away from the Saviour As vile as a sinner could be And I wondered if Christ the Redeemer Could save a poor sinner like me Not a ray of light could I see, and the thought filled my heart with sadness. There's no hope for a sinner like me. dark lonely hour a voice sweetly whispered to me saying look unto me I have power to save a poor sinner like thee By the end of the first week, a change was evident in many people. This became a talking point in chapel, pub and workplace. This change even affected Evan's home. Our family has had a great change. My sister, a girl of 16, who before was a sarcastic and peevish girl, has had a grand change. And her testimony is that she is happy now and that there is some joy in living. You can see the change in her face. Not everyone was positive. Some said that he was out of his mind. Others questioned that if the Holy Spirit is at work, why doesn't he come before midnight? Some called him a deceiver. Evan Roberts' controversial methods became such a talking point that people were coming to the meetings to decide for themselves, and they were overflowing. Evan described the second week as a week of direct prayer. This began on the Sunday evening. The revivalist himself described the scene. After the service, I continued until it was 12 o'clock. I said I was not satisfied with it and that we must get the blessing, even if it were necessary to stay down until daybreak. I said that we would have to strive with heaven. Now we must believe that the Spirit will come, not think he will come, not hope he will come, but finally believe that he will come. After this, the Spirit said that everyone was to pray. Pray now, not confess, not sing, not give experiences, but pray and believe and want, and this is the prayer. Send the Spirit now for Jesus' sake. The people were sitting and only closed their eyes. The prayer began with me and then it went from seat to seat. Boys and girls, young men and maidens, some asking in silence, some aloud, some coldly, some with warmth, some formally, some in tears, some with difficulty, 
some adding to it, boys and girls, strong voices, then tender voices. Oh, wonderful. I never thought of such an effect. This will be the plan for the week. Everyone to pray individually for the Spirit. Send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Evan Roberts' enthusiasm was unbounded and often overpowering. Meetings went on until three or four in the morning, and it wasn't long before the press got to know of the religious goings-on at Lacher. On Thursday, November the 10th, the first report appeared in the columns of the Western Mail. By Friday the 11th, the Western Mail had sent a special correspondent to cover the events in detail. A remarkable religious revival is now taking place at Lacher. For some days, a young man named Evan Roberts, a native of Lacher, but at present a student at Newcastle Emlyn, has been causing great surprise by his extraordinary orations at Mariah Chapel. Such excitement has prevailed that the road in which the chapel is situated has been lined with people from end to end. Roberts, who speaks in Welsh, opens his discourse by saying he does not know what he is going to say, but that when he is in communion with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak, and he will simply be the medium of his wisdom. Soon all the other newspapers followed suit, and consistent coverage was to continue well into 1905. This not only chronicled events, but also created a hunger for similar outpourings of the Spirit throughout the Principality. Evan Roberts' progress from Lucher to the Valleys, Liverpool and North Wales, was reported and analysed. Here was the new Howell Harris. Here was a young man, sincere, enthusiastic, who spoke the language of the people. Interest in him grew from day to day. And he wasn't the only revivalist. Joseph Jenkins and his new key team made a huge impact in North Wales. R.B. Jones' preaching was the instrument of revival in Ross and Anglesey. W.W. Lewis continued to speak at conventions for the deepening of the spiritual life alongside W.S. Jones, recently moved from Penuel Chapel, Carmarthen, to the Rhonda. Many other local ministers and young people also took up the challenge to reach Wales. Still, many of the national papers couldn't get away from their fascination with Evan Roberts. One of the first press interviews was on Friday, November the 11th, to Brindley Evans, the editor of the Llanelli Mercury. It gives us a glimpse of the revivalist at this early stage. The young missioner was full of enthusiasm for his work, but there were traces in his deathly white face of severe mental stress.